happens in just a moment. Junior church, sixth grade and down, uh, you're dismissed. You can go right back through those doors. Got some special things for those kids today. Aren't they a good looking bunch of boys and girls? Good singing, the whole congregation, and just good, just good, a good Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, I like to be reminded of that. In the 50s and 60s, there was a TV series by the name of Perry Mason, and it still airs today, you can see it, it's, it's streamed on a lot of the apps on your TV. And Perry Mason in that series was a defense lawyer and sort of a, a sleuth who solved murder mysteries. And he relied heavily on his, on his sidekick, Paul Drake. You remember Paul Drake? <laughs> Paul Drake was his uh, private investigator. And Paul would go out and do all the heavy footwork and finding out all the information and watching and surveilling and, and he'd bring the information back to Mason and uh, they would solve some very complicated investigations. And that's, that show is still my wife's very favorite of all the shows on TV. She still loves Perry Mason. And uh, private investigators are hired by someone who wants to find out information that's not easily obtained and by a questioner who wants just to know some facts. And the resurrection of Jesus is a mystery to many who need to do some private investigation and find out the facts. A lot of people, especially on Resurrection Sunday, around Easter time, People, a lot of people just kind of wonder about the resurrection. They hear a little about the resurrection. They think about it a little bit. And sounds a little bit far-fetched to some of the folks. And so they may raise an eyebrow and think about it for a little while. But then but they really don't know if it fits the facts. People have a natural fear of death. Self-preservation. We want to. We want to live. I mean, we don't want to go out there and step in fr out on the street in front of a semi and get squashed. Uh, people know, in the back of their mind, people know that we live for a set number of years. I don't know how many years that is. The Bible talks about about seventy years being average uh, a lifespan. Some live a lot longer, and some live less, uh, fewer years, and people realize that death's going to come to every one of us. Not, not one of us in this room today is going to get out of this world alive. <laughs> Barring the, resurrect, or the, uh, the rapture of the church. <laughs> uh, when funerals happen, J.T. DeWitt is a funeral director. He sees this every week. People come face to face with death, I go to the graveyard and put a loved one away. They're buried. And a lot of people are standing there wondering, hoping that there's a resurrection and looking forward as their only hope at that point to see the loved one again. If the resurrection of Jesus is not the primary place where we go to start a belief of a personal resurrection, then there's no such thing. It has to start with Jesus. The Christian faith hinges upon that fact. If there's no resurrection, we ought to just fold up our Bibles, get up out of our seats and walk home and never go to church again. There would be no sense in it. Okay, okay Sarah, Sarah, you know. What will be, will be. Easter is not 
simply a time of hunting eggs at the city park and having ham for lunch. Now, I kind of like boiled eggs, and I really like ham. <laughs> but <laughs> if Easter is no more than that, we're in trouble. Without Jesus literally and bodily rising from the dead out of that tomb after three days, then Christianity is no better than any of the other religions of the world. Christianity is built upon the factualness of the resurrection. We're all going to die. We all wonder, when will the resurrection be? And some wonder, will there even be one? Some wonder, if there is one, will I be in it? Well, that's all the bad news, but now the good news is this, that the resurrection is real. Jesus really did come out of the tomb, and it's a fact. It is a fact, and the good news is that you can come out of the tomb too. And we can learn that there's good evidence, and we're going to do that today. We're going to do an investigation. You and I will be, uh, you and I can be Paul Drake, the right-hand man for Perry Mason today. We're going to look at some facts and see if there's some clues that will lead us to believe that there's no other possibility except that the resurrection is true, it's real, and there's no other way that it can be. We're going to do an investigation of the resurrection today. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 13. Resurrec resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 13. Paul says in verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For the if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. They, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Can we pray together? Father, help us today to be renewed in spirit about the resurrection, to be renewed in hope. Lord, we don't hope as though it were wishful thinking, but our hope as Christians lies solidly in the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And Father, I pray that you'd help us as Christians to be revived concerning this thing of the resurrection today. And Father, for those who have not placed their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, I pray that today they would become convinced in their heart that Jesus is alive, He is well, and Jesus saves. I pray that you'd bless us to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lee Strobel was a an, invest, an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. His wife got saved. I mean, he was a successful guy. He had a good job. His wife got saved. He, him being an atheist, he set out to, he was a little embarrassed about his wife becoming a Christian. He set out to prove that Jesus was a myth, that the, that the cross was of no effect, and that the resurrection is not real, and that she's wasting her time. I kind of have some flashbacks of going back to the time my wife was th saved three years before me, and I remember having some of those thoughts, like Lee Strobel. Lee was educated and got a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, and later got a Yale Law School, Master of Studies, Master of Law Studies. Now, I'm telling you that, not, not to 
brag on somebody because they had a college degree and a master's degree and went to Yale. But I'm saying that simply for this reason. This is no dummy. This is not somebody who is a backwoods hillbilly that didn't know anything except just what he'd been taught by his parents. This is somebody who was an atheist and was educated in the, some of the highest educational institutions of the land. And he set out to prove that Jesus was not real. And if he was real, he was not the miraculous Savior who rose from the dead. While he set out to prove this, to show his wife that she was wasting her time, he began to uncover evidences, facts, that would be in a court of law convincing to any jury if they were honest. And while he was trying to disprove Jesus, Lee Strobel became a believer, as have untold hundreds and hundreds of people over the years and centuries. When they honestly set out to uncover the facts, <laughs> they become convinced this is real. Jesus is real. The resurrection is real. Jesus really saves and they themselves trust in him. They're born again and become Christians. I, I uh, heard about the, the grandfather who wanted to see how much his four-year-old granddaughter knew about Easter. And so he sat her on his lap and, and uh, he said, uh, Julie, why do we celebrate Easter? And without hesitating, she said, well, Jesus was crucified. After, his, after he died, his body was put into a tomb, and they rolled a big stone in front of the door. And on the third day, there was a big earthquake, and that stone rolled away. And Grandpa was amazed. He, he was really impressed that his little granddaughter knew that much. But then she went on and said, When the earthquake happened, the entire town came out to the grave, and it, when Jesus came out, if he saw his shadow, there'd be six more weeks of winter. Some people may think that's about all there is. Hey, we need to know what is right about the resurrection. We need to get it right. And this morning, I want to concentrate on the overwhelming data that's available to show strongly that Jesus is real, the resurrection did happen, just as the Bible says. How do we start? Well, first, let's consider the statement of the conditions. You know, the, the investigator wants to know the kind of the background, the story as a whole before he tries to find out facts about it. So the statement of the conditions, the story that we're going to investigate in this message today, what really does matter supremely is whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Jesus staked his whole reputation on the claim that he would rise from the dead and that he did, in fact, rise from the dead. If it did happen, as he and the biblical authors claim, then it authenticates everything that Jesus said in every other area. But if the resurrection did not happen, as Jesus had predicted, then we have no reason to believe anything else that he's claimed as well. You see how important the resurrection is, it's all or none. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, in our text we read that, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. It means empty, nothing to it. Ye are yet in your sins. The resurrection is either one of the most wicked and heart-wrenching claims of history or it's true and validates who Jesus is. And we'll discover this morning the overwhelming proof that Jesus did exactly what he claimed he was going to do. In Acts 1-3 it says, He showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. That means there's no error there. The claims are true. Now let's, let's look at three clues together. We're, we're walking together in an investigation. And we want to look at three clues that put this puzzle together. This mystery solves the mystery of whether or not the resurrection is true. We can see the clues that finally bring... You've heard somebody say, well, get a clue. Well, we're going to get a clue today. 
we're going to see the evidence for the resurrection. Let's focus on three clues. First of all, the clue of the empty tomb. The empty tomb. The Bible teaches that professional executioners, Roman soldiers, crucified Jesus. And they, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, we read in other scriptures, placed, they, they begged the body of Jesus from Pilate, the local king, once they discovered that he was really dead. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night, were kind of secret disciples. Both of them were rich and well-respected, but now they come out in the open. They're ready to be identified with Jesus. And so they take his body from the cross and put him in a stone, a stone-hewn tomb. I've stood there. If, if this, in fact, the garden tomb that is in Israel today, I've stood there and looked at that rock face where a room is carved out in a solid rock. And the bed on which the corpse lie, was lying was solid stone. A place, kind of a stone pillow for the head and a little trough chiseled out for the feet of the corpse. And this is by Gordon's Calvary there in Israel. And they claim that this is good evidence that this tomb is the one that Jesus lay in. Now whether we, we don't really know, but... They make a lot of money from tourists by claiming that anyway. And so if that tomb was really Jesus' tomb or not, really doesn't make any difference because the Bible says that he was crucified, that he was laying in a stone tomb. But by looking at that tomb, and I actually entered into it and, and could see how they had carved it all out. Somebody went to a lot of work to make a tomb like that. And you know that thing was pretty solid? <laughs> I mean, that's something you couldn't break in or break out of very easily. Well, the, the body of Jesus was placed in a tomb, either that one or one like it, and then a large stone weighing, commentators estimate it to weigh two to 3,000 pounds, a, a round, like a big stone wheel, they roll in a little trough along the bottom, a, a rock trough, they would roll that stone over in front of the door. And then 16 Roman soldiers were assigned to guard and secure that tomb after the body was placed in there. Now these soldiers, these soldiers were not the kind of uh, soldiers who just played games. These guys were rough, tough. I think they were Marines probably. These guys were rough and tough and quite honestly many of those Roman soldiers were given to cruelty and nobody got over on them. And they were assigned to guard that tomb to make sure nothing happened to the body of, of Jesus. Once that stone was rolled in front of the door, they placed a seal upon it with the emperor's official insignia. And nobody would break that seal except under the threat of execution. I'm, I'm saying all this to say this, that, that that tomb was pretty secure. Solid rock, big stone door, 2,000 pounds, 16 uh, Roman soldiers who would just soon kill you as look at you. And in spite of all these precautions, <laughs> uh, that Sunday morning, they found that tomb was empty. How did that happen? Critics down through the years have not been able to refute the empty tomb, so they come up with other stories. They say, well, maybe the disciples stole the body. Yeah, with those Roman soldiers camped out right beside of it, and they're rolling a 2,000-pound rock in the middle of the night, and nobody heard it, and they stole his body. These cowards who ran... At the cross of Christ, they ran and hid because they didn't want to be crucified. Now these cowards suddenly got brave enough to confront 16 soldiers and roll a 2,000-pound door away from the grave and steal the body. <laughs> They'd have to invent quite a myth to say that Jesus was alive. 
Well, they come up with another. The critics come up with another. If you, if you don't believe that one, then the critics come up with another uh, story. They say, well, maybe, maybe the, uh, the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders of that day, maybe they stole his body. Well, <laughs> that wouldn't make a lot of sense because they were, trying to, they were trying to show that Jesus really was dead. So if they stole the body, they wouldn't hide it out. They'd parade it down the streets of Jerusalem and show everybody, here's your, here's your Messiah, he's dead. <laughs> so they didn't do it. The critics can't explain it away. Leaders of every other religion in the whole world, they base their religion on a lot of things, but none of them base it on a risen Savior. If you were to go to Confucius' tomb, as they sang about a little while ago, you'd find that that bunch of bones from Confucius has decayed and dissolved and sunk into the ground. Same for Muhammad. It's gone. He's not alive. He's dead. And the same thing goes for Buddha. Buddha's tomb is is there, it's still there in the remains. If you would do a DNA analysis, you could find the remains of all that exists from Buddha, but not the tomb of Jesus. <laughs> not, one, not one iota of his remains are in that tomb because he walked out. He claimed that he would rise from the dead on the third day, and that's exactly... What he did. Well, let's look at clue B, the second clue. What was the first one? An empty tomb. And it wasn't just an empty tomb. There's a lot of, a lot of strength goes along with that argument to prove not only was it empty, it couldn't happen any other way, but Jesus come out because he was risen from the dead. But clue number two that helped us put this puzzle together and solve the mystery of the resurrection. That is that of multiple witnesses. <laughs> Could a second clue help us? You see, these disciples that are explaining the resurrection, they didn't just say, man, we saw an empty tomb. Well, <laughs> that's not 100% foolproof in itself. And so the disciples, even some of the disciples themselves, needed more proof. They weren't sure. The Bible says that some of them doubted. And the second clue is, besides the empty tomb, there were eyewitnesses that bolsters the idea that this resurrection is real. When they, uh, they talked to others, they said, man, there was an empty tomb, and and we know a lot of people that saw Jesus after the resurrection. Acts 1.3 says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. More than 515 eyewitnesses saw him on 12 different occasions. That's pretty strong evidence added to an empty tomb, and you've got over 500 eyewitnesses, Jesus gave unquestionable proof that he was alive by showing up so they could see. There was once that he appeared to a woman in the cemetery. She saw him. He walked through closed doors and talked with some frightened followers after his resurrection. He walked side by side with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us when we talked with him by the way? I said, that, that was Jesus. That was him. Eyewitnesses. He appeared to believers and doubters. He appeared to tough-minded men. He appeared to tender-hearted people as well. He appeared to believers and unbelievers. Several people saw him on more than one occasion. 1 Corinthians 5, 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, which, uh, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The reason Jesus died was because you and I are sinners. You see, you don't get to heaven just because you decide to be good one day. 
the sins have to be taken away. Why did he die on that cross? His blood paid for your sins. If you believe in anything else, you believe in your good works, your baptism, your church membership, you believe in anything else, doing good deeds, being kind to little old ladies and little old men and small children and dogs, <laughs> it won't get you anywhere. you got sins that have to be paid for. It's the blood of Christ that paid for your sins. Verse 4 says and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why is it important that, that he was buried? Because it proves that he was really dead. You see, it was because he was a human that he died and it was because he was God that he walked out of that tomb. He was 100% man and 100% God. And he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain under the, this present but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. The apostle Paul said, I met him on the Damascus road. He saved my soul that day. I saw him. You see, eyewitness is pretty, pretty strong evidence. What if, is Joey in here or is he back in junior church? Is he back there? Joey Corbett just got officially hired on to the Searcy Police Department. We're trying to get all of our people converted over to either be policemen, troopers, or firefighters, right? <laughs> so I, I told somebody yesterday, we're trying to get everybody in law enforcement. That way, if I know everybody personally, maybe I can speed and they won't give me a ticket. <laughs> let's say Joey Corbett's already out on the patrol, and, and let's say that I come through the intersection at Race and Main and my trusty Ford pickup, and I, I drive through Race and Main, Ray, Race and Main, yeah, it starts at Mason Rain. <laughs> I drive through that intersection and lo and behold somebody comes out of the blue and runs a red light and smacks my Ford pickup my beautiful Ford pickup right in the side and Joey comes up he's assigned to investigate that accident so he comes up and uh, he says uh, uh, do, do you all have any eyewitnesses that saw what happened well no we don't have any then it would be my word against the word of the fellow who hit me who was at fault? No eyewitnesses. That's not very powerful. Is it just me claiming I did it? Brother Joey says, well, I'd like to believe you, Pastor, but after all, you can't see out of that one eye, and so uh, I'm not sure <laughs> about you. Maybe it's true and maybe it's not, but we've got equal eyewitnesses. You're your own eyewitness, and he's his own eyewitness. That's not a very powerful statement. But what if we look around and find one guy that was standing on the corner and he says, yeah, I, I saw it. The guy in the white Ford pickup was on a green light and the guy on the other side had a red light, but he ran the red light and ran into Mr. Brooks. Then I, I've got an eyewitness. That makes it a little bit better on my side, don't you think? What if we look around and find three eyewitnesses? And all three of them say, yeah, that white Ford pickup was going through a green light, and the guy in the, and the, guy in the uh, Chevy pickup, he didn't, because he was driving a no-count Chevy, he didn't care if it got wrecked anyway. Just kidding, relax. <laughs> and so he, he runs into the side of, of Mr. Brooks' truck. I got three eyewitnesses, that makes it better, right? I'm doing pretty good. What if there's 12 eyewitnesses, and all of them are on my side? They say, I, I was doing the right thing. The guy that ran the red light did the wrong thing. What if I had 100 eyewitnesses? That's a pretty strong case. And all of them agree with me. I'm in pretty good shape now. What if we had over 500 lined up on the sidewalk by race in Maine and all 500 of them said, yep, yeah, we all saw it and every one of us agree the white truck was in, going through on a green light the other one was coming through on a red light and ran into him. You see, your case gets stronger with eyewitnesses. How many eyewitnesses did Jesus have that he rose from the dead and that people saw him? They saw him with their own eyeballs. Over 500. I don't know about you, but I've got pretty good confidence in what Jesus said. I've got pretty good confidence that five people who agree that he rose from the dead and they saw him, I've got pretty good confidence in that, don't you? We're putting the pieces to the puzzle together. And just imagine 
how strong a case that would be for me in a traffic accident, but just imagine how strong a case that is for the resurrection of Christ. Well, the tomb was empty, and it's verifiable. We had 500, over 500 witnesses. Somebody said, well, preacher, we, we didn't see it with our own eyes. We're just, we, all we can do is read that there were five, over 500 witnesses. How many of you, sorry, I, I didn't get to see it myself, so I'm not sure I can believe it. How many of you believe George Washington was the first president? Go ahead, raise your hand. How do you know he was? Were you there? Has there been one person in this room that saw George Washington? Besides Lloyd Smith. <laughs> Nobody in here saw George Washington. You know how we know he was the first president? And we know he was a real person? We read what a bunch of dead men wrote. You know how we believe and know that Jesus was a real person and he rose from the dead? What some dead men wrote. But the difference is these dead men were inspired by the Holy Ghost of God and I've got more confidence in them than I have the ones who saw George Washington. <laughs> An empty tomb. An empty tomb. Multiple witnesses and number three, clue C changed lives. What are we doing? We're putting together the puzzle, the mystery, the missing pieces as it were to the puzzle, the mystery of whether the resurrection is real or not and whether it matters. Empty tomb, eyewitnesses, and changed lives. I want you to know when I got saved, my life was different. You say, I don't, I don't think you're perfect, Brother Brooks. I don't either. <laughs> I know more about me than anybody in this room, and I know how bad I am. <laughs> but I also know how bad I was before I got saved, and my life is different today because he changed me. I know how I was a drunkard and a dope user and a, an adulterer and a, and a miserable sinner. I understand all of that, and I remember all of that, and it grieves me to this day. But I have a Savior who saved me because he came out of the tomb for me because he loved me. He changed me when I believed on him. J.T. DeWitt comes from a background kind of like that. And he's still not perfect. If you don't believe it, ask Miss Helen. <laughs> Chad came from a background like that. He's not in jail anymore. Not using drugs and alcohol. God changed him. Why? Because he believed on the Savior, the one who came out of the tomb. And that Savior can change lives. And change lives is exactly what we're going to look at right here. You remember how the disciples at the crucifixion were scattered? Man, they're going everywhere. They're hiding out. They don't want to be killed. But after the resurrection and they see the resurrected Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. They're not cowards anymore. In fact... In John chapter 20, verse 19, then the same, day, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the, of the Jews. And came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed them unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. He gave them peace that day. They had been cowards, but now, instead of having fear, they've got peace. These were ordinary men who were transformed from frightened wimps to courageous evangelists, apostles, disciples, proponents of the Lord who testified publicly of His resurrection. Now how, listen to me, if their lives were not changed by the resurrection, why would these cowards suddenly be so brave and risk their lives? Something changed because they saw him. Was it for money, power, fame? No. No, they had a message that they saw validated and they believed it. And they figured if he could save them, he could save others too. 
Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged through the streets until he was dead. Peter, Simon, Andrew, and Philip were crucified. James was beheaded. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Thomas was pierced with lances. James, the last, was thrown, in, thrown from a temple and stoned to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Paul was stoned, whipped, imprisoned, and beheaded. Did they do all that knowing that the resurrection was a farce? Did all of those disciples who knew Jesus personally, did they go willingly to their deaths because they thought the resurrection was not real? I submit to you something changed. They were willing to die. All they had to do when they were threatened with death, all they had to do was say, no, Jesus is alive. Or he's dead, rather. All they had to do was say, yeah, he's dead. But they didn't. You know what they said? He is alive. It got him killed, and that's the whole point. Why would anybody die for something that was not true? They knew the truth whether the resurrection was real or not, and they wouldn't die for a lie. Well, Jesus changes lives. Let's put a final analysis on it. Thinking men and women will want to gather the facts about the resurrection so that they can see if it's real. The clues add up to a conclusion. How do you explain away the empty tomb? How do you argue against multiple witnesses? How do you get away from the fact that lives are changed because of the resurrection? The evidence is strong and compelling. Some of you might be bored with all this and say, it's all academic. What does it mean to me anyway? <laughs> well, I have to admit to you, I've, I've heard some things preached. I've heard things in the news and so forth. I've read things in books that may have been true, but it didn't really seem to have much effect on me. It wasn't something I was excited about. But I want to give you something from this story that does matter and it makes a difference in your life. It applies in a remarkable way. The question of doubt. How important is it that you have that doubt satisfied knowing that it's real? The question of loneliness. Why does it matter if you're lonely because Jesus can come to you and give you peace. The question of weakness. How can I find the power to change, to lay aside the sins that have dominated my life? The question of guilt. You say, I know I'm a dirty, no-count sinner. When you come to Jesus, He can wash you as white as snow. He'll wash away the sins, and He washes away the guilt. The question of death, what happens when I die? I said we all have a fear of death, and that's kind of natural. But wouldn't we all like to know that the grave is not the end? Wouldn't we all like to know that there's going to be a resurrection morning for us as well as Jesus? When we think about his resurrection, that's what makes it possible. For when, That's why all the graves, have you ever noticed in a graveyard, they're all facing which way, Brother JT? East. east. <laughs> He's been in a lot of graves. They face them to the east in expectancy of Jesus coming in the resurrection as the lightning shineth un, from the east unto the west. I would like to know that when I set up out of that grave, oh, that's the west, I better face this way. When I set up on that resurrection morning, I'm going to set up facing the east from the direction, facing the direction from which Jesus comes. 
I don't want to stay in the ground forever. I don't want to be dead like a dog. I want to live eternally, don't you? I want to know that my soul will live on and that one day my soul will be re reunited with this body that will be changed. I want to know that, don't you? Amen. Those are things that matter because of the resurrection of Jesus. It's time to make a decision. Is the resurrection real and does it matter? It's time to decide to receive him as Savior if you're not saved. Has the light come on this morning? Maybe somebody watching on the internet suddenly says, you know, I have never placed my faith in Jesus for salvation. This is the day. This is the time. The resurrection is real. Jesus is really alive. And if I place my faith in him once for all forever and am born again, I'll never lose sight of that hope that one of these days I'll be reunited with loved ones and with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Our Father, we're grateful for the evidences of the resurrection. And Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice who has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior at some point in time, genuinely turning to Him for salvation. I pray that they do it this very day. Make this the best Easter ever in their lives. I pray, Lord, for the, for the Christian who has just kind of got dead and dry and concerned with things of this life and things of this world and have lost sight of the hope of the resurrection and eternal life. Lord, this life is awfully short, but eternity is very long. I pray that you help the ones who are not Christians to place their faith in Christ, to trust Him as Savior this day, and to revive those who believe on Christ and the resurrection, to be rejuvenated, renewed, revived, resuscitated, and find a new passion for living for eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand, please, as we stand together?